Hello, my name is Philip Wiesbowski, and I am the Coast Care Facilitator for Port Phillip and Western Port. I would like to welcome you to the third live event for Summer by the Sea 2021. I hope you're enjoying the variety of topics on offer. I would like to acknowledge the Aboriginal traditional owners of the various lands on which we are all meeting across the state and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging and to any Aboriginal people in the audience. You may be aware that the Summer by the Sea program is an annual program of free events delivered by Coast Care Victoria within, with support from coastal and marine volunteers, activity providers, and in partnership with agencies, including Parks Victoria. The aim of the Summer program is to inspire you to get out and about on the coast and to learn while you're having fun. I'll pass you over to Tracy for some housekeeping matters. Hi everyone. As Phil mentioned, my name is Tracy Miller Armstrong and I am the Coast Care Victoria facilitator for the South Gippsland region. I'll be running you through a quick bit of housekeeping before handing over to Kay to begin his presentation. If you're not familiar with Microsoft Teams live events, you now see on your screen a slide showing a live event Q&A panel. The Q&A panel allows for questions and conversation. Unlike a regular Microsoft Teams event, you will not have the capability to speak directly to the presenter, nor have your video available for viewing. The Q&A panel can be found by clicking on the two speech bubbles in the top right corner of your screen. If you have any questions during the presentation, please enter these into the Q&A under the My Questions tab, and myself and my colleague Bethany behind the scenes will monitor the Q&A throughout, and Cade will answer questions at the end of his presentation. As a bit of a test, could you please now have a go and pop in the chat how many people, including yourself, are watching tonight? We're going to be using the chat function throughout the presentation, so it's a great opportunity to have a little test. This live event will be recorded and an encore presentation will be available to watch on Thursday, the 21st of January. I'll now hand you over to Kay to begin his presentation. Thank you. Well. I'm waiting for a little red box to come my way. Here I am. Hello. It's good to see one person can use the Q&A uh, bubble there because oh, we've got two that can use the Q&A bubble. Good to see. So the first slide that's in front of you is not a box of sea slugs. There's, there's a prize, a special prize. If you look over my shoulder, there's a poster of a sea slug poster there to the first person that can correctly type in the Q&A what that actually is or what is in the box there. So that is just something to keep this Q&A thing ticking over because there'll be a bit of gambling going on later. So I wanna make sure you're familiar with it. I'm not seeing any answers come through. So keep guessing. I'm not gonna tell you what it is. Hopefully it'll get there. Oh, someone's even saying hello. Hi, Kaz. Anyway, let's move on from this. Just give me a second. All right. Slugging it out for science. So tonight I'm here to talk to you about sea slugs. Um, I work for the Victorian National Parks Association and this project is a project that's done in partnership with the Southern Cross University, which are running sea slug censuses throughout the well, the country and in some parts of Indonesia and um, tropical areas. Basically, it's a way of getting people together, getting them out of the water. And tonight I'm going to introduce you to the world of sea slugs if you aren't already familiar with it. If you're familiar with it, hopefully I'm going to teach you a thing or two. If I don't end up teaching you a thing or two, don't blame me. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of people that are probably even online here that are going to be able to help you out with. But I want you to come away with three things tonight. 
So the first is I want you to be pumped and ready to go and find your first or your hundredth sea slug. I want you to get an appreciation of how much we still have to learn about our local marine environment. One of the things with these slugs is they're often quite tiny. And by looking closely, you get a really good appreciation for the diversity and what we actually have there and why it's important to care for our coast or you know, coast care. There's a nice plug for the coast care crew. And I want you to basically learn about, learn about your local, inspired, be inspired to learn about your local environment at your own pace and how you can contribute to all of us knowing a little bit more about it. So when it comes to slugs, this is the first thing that comes to mind. These guys found in the garden or the ones that you've picked off your plants or salt, which doesn't necessarily go well with slugs on land, but when it comes to those in the sea, they thrive. As you can see, the colors are absolutely incredible compared to what you've, what you're used to seeing when it comes to the land slugs. Sorry, I've just lost my place. And there's an amazing rate, amazing rate of body shapes. Um, you've got the, sort of bubbly one that's quite green there that fits in well with its weed that looks exactly the same. The purple and orange one actually swims through the water column. And then you've got a few different colors that are down there. So they come in an amazing array of body shapes and colors. So just to get started, what even is a sea slug? So a slug is not necessarily a animal that has a common ancestor, it's just a body shape. So I've often been referred to as a slug when I'm sitting at home on the couch. Um, it's not because I have a common ancestor with slugs, it's probably just my posture. There's slugs in the order of pulmonata, which is basically with the ones that you find on land, so land snails, and they're actually air breathing slugs. So there are sea slugs that breathe air. You'll generally find them in mangroves and that sort of shallow water. So it's one spot to look. And the others are called epistobranchs or sea snails. And basically slugs are just snails that have lost their shells. So if you want a word to try and jam into a conversation Tomorrow, try detorsion. Uh, detorsion is actually the evolutionary process in which slugs have lost their shell, or basically the shell has moved into the in, inside the body and is absolutely tiny and can't really be seen. So technically, the only ones that we have here that are nudibranchs are A and F in the picture. Uh, e and C are sap slugging, sap sucking sea slugs, which I will get to later and explain. D is a side gilled sea slug, and B is actually a flatworm, so it's completely unrelated to the slugs. So, moving on. The slugs are incredible. Um, when it comes to trying to talk about your favorite, it's a little bit too difficult. It's trying to ask a parent what they, who their favorite kid is, although I have met some parents that find that quite easy. When it comes to sea slugs, some of the, let's say, superpowers that they have are quite interesting. And it's come about because, you know, to survive in a cruel world with when you don't effectively have any shell or any armor, they've evolved all sorts of defenses. So first up, and here's another word to try and jam into a conversation, is aposematism. Ap and what that is, is that this sea slug itself isn't necessarily, um, that isn't necessarily, uh, I'm just gonna say untasty, but that's not a very good, very good English. It's not necessarily that animals can't eat this, but the colors on it and the flamboyance and the look of it is basically just advertising. It's like, go on, eat me if you want, but I don't taste good and you're gonna end up sick. So you'll find a lot of things um, have that even in sort of the natural world. They have these sort of flamboyant colors, which are basically used to send the signal that I'm not to be messed with. We also have incredibly cryptic and camouflage. Hopefully you can see just above the super, there are actually two nudibranchs in that pink sponge. Um, if they were anywhere else in the habitat, they would stand out like the proverbials on a dog, but they're not. They're on their home, own habitat. They actually lay eggs on this sponge and the juveniles will basically feed straight on it. Hence, that's where the, the color comes from. So incredibly well camouflaged, which can make them quite difficult to find. They can also spit acid. That's another way to deter. Um, there's the side gilled sea slug that was in the picture earlier. Basically, it spits a sort of, I think it's sulfuric, but I could be wrong. Please correct me if I am but spits out acid about the same pH as lemon juice. So it's kind of like getting lemon juice in your eyes if they're disturbed. And then we have, these are some of my favorite, 
This is the solar powered sea slug, and then these guys are kleptomaniac sea slugs, which is same as the solar powered ones. The one on the left, the big green one, actually sucks the chloroplasts out of plants. So it will steal the cells that uh, photosynthesize, bring them through their body, it display them out on their body, and then basically use that energy that is created by the chloroplasts to fuel themselves. Um, similar to coral having that symbiotic, well, it's a symbiotic relationship with coral. These guys actually steal it and use it to harness energy. And that means they're not as reliant on eating. They can basically use the energy there. The other two, so we've got the blue glaucus, which is up close on the right hand side. Uh, it will chew on the stinging cells of a blue bottle. The one in the middle will actually sting, chew on the stinging cells of a hydroid. And it's able to ingest them without setting off the stinging cells. So the easiest way to think of the stinging cells is actually like a coiled spring that's just got a trigger, you flick that and the spring goes and it puts, um, sends out like an, a stinging cell. These guys are able to eat it, ingest it again through their body and then they bring it onto those outer sort of um, appendages on the outside that are quite sort of you know, floppy out there. That's the technical description for it. And they can actually store those stinging cells there. So again, if something was to come along and have a crack at it, it's got that defense that it doesn't have to produce itself, it can steal it from other things. So this is just some of the amazing things. Their sex life is incredible. It is um, probably some of the most interesting sort of reproduction strategies going on. Um, I'm not getting hot under the collar. I was actually itchy. Um, here, they're actually hermaphrodites. So they can basically have the male and the female bits in the same both they carry the male and the female bits and they mate by aligning the genital apertures, which is that photo up in the left. You can see we've blacked out, you know, we can't show their faces where parents and with kids could be watching this and they are able to simultaneously reproduce. The conga line that we have down the bottom, uh, I mentioned that. So some of the other strategies are the conga line that we have down the bottom where the slug in front will play the role of the female. The slug behind will play the role of the male to the female in front, but will play the role of the female to the male that's behind, so on and so forth. And they can do conga lines or they can actually form circles where it closes the loop and they're all reproducing each other. Um, there's also some head stabbing that goes on during reproduction with one species and there's another one that has detachable penises and can, oh, I think it's, can within 72 hours, it can basically create or mate three times with three detachable penises. If you want to know more, please ask questions in the QA function. I could tell you all about these things and I could go on for hours, but I'm not gonna do that unless you ask me questions at the end, then I'm more than happy to talk about it. No, today I'm actually going to talk about what the following cast of nudie nerds found in one tidal cycle at Point Lonsdale just last week. So this is last Monday. If everyone remembers the hot day. A few of us went down and thought for this presentation, we're actually going to go out and try and find what we can in a local area so that people sort of have a feel for what they can find and how to go about doing it. So the cast. Number one nudie nerd is Nicole Merton. She's the other half of the ReefWatch team. She has an incredible knowledge of sea slugs and has almost finished writing a guide to some nudies in Victoria. Um, I'm not here to talk about that, but again, feel free to ask questions about it. Um, you can put them in now and I'll answer your questions at the end. The other one is Nick, the nudie lover from way back. Nick is actually a school teacher in his spare time and also a father of four kids. So how he finds time to go looking for nudie branks, I do not know, but he joined us on this day. And then there's this guy who got dressed up for a party on New Year's Eve and wanted to party like it's 1999. And as you can tell from the picture of me now, I must have partied really hard. And here we go, this is me. Actually being a little bit more serious, it happens. So competition time. So hopefully you've warmed up that Q&A function. You know how to type, you know how to enter something. What you see there is the poster that is also behind me. I have quite a few of these to give away. So whoever wins this competition and whoever won the previous um, will get your address and I'm gonna post out a few of these to you there. Like a, uh, I don't know what size it is, but they're a good poster size. 
They were basically designed so they could go on the back of the toilet door and people could learn about some of the sea slugs of Victoria, or you can put them up in your study. It's got over, it's got 34 of over the 300 species known in Victoria. So competition, here we go. Of the three cast, the cast that you've met already, of the three people, I want you to name who you think is going to find the most. I also want you to have, I guess we'll play like jelly beans in a jar, closest to the pin. So the total number of species that were found by the three of us combined. If you guess over 20 or 20, you've guessed too many. And I'll let you know that we've all found at least one species. So it's between three and 20. So get started in the Q&A, start entering those details. Um, and I'll give you a warning when it comes to cutoff time. Hopefully someone gets there. So I mentioned we went on a Rockpool Ramel, and it was just last Monday, the 11th of January. The reason that we went wasn't because it was going to be 36 degrees in the middle of the day, no, and that we got to spend a day looking in rock pools. Um, yeah, actually, maybe that did have something to do with it, but it is not necessarily the best conditions for finding sea slugs. I've been told that the way you find them is to think like a slug. So think of when you see slugs out on your garden path. Um, or around the garden, that's very similar to sea slugs. They don't like um, a lot of warm weather. They'll get out of the sun and they tend to be in the shade and in the cooler sort of spots. But anyway, we went out then and this is the public service announcement sort of uh, slide as well. So if you are thinking of going out or when you do go out, particularly on a day like that, slip, slop, slap, check the swell on that particular day. I don't have the swell graph here. The swell was quite low, but more importantly, the tide, if you look at the tide on the Monday, which is the first day on the tidal graph, it was, what was it, a 0.27 tide. So generally anything below a 0.6 is quite okay, but a 0.27 is extremely low, which means it gives you quite a lot of time to be there. Check it and obviously check your tides, never turn your back on the ocean, wear sturdy shoes, gloves is another one, particularly if you're sort of looking around, um, you know, blue rings are found in uh, rock pools as well bring water, stay hydrated. And the other reason we went out on this day is because we weren't able to participate in National Step in a Puddle and Splash Your Friends Day, or I certainly didn't want to do National Clean Off Your Desk Day. So, first nudie, we got to the site at about 12 o'clock. We would have been in the water about quarter past 12. We found our first one at 12.31. The spotter was Nicole. She was the only one to have seen it. Now that is Nicole's thumb or finger in the left hand side of that frame. And the nudie brain is that the, it's actually a bubble shell. Is that little browny sort of mottled blob you've seen there. So that was the first one found within about 15 minutes. And as you can see, it's unlike a branch that a coralline algae. And this is in water, I would say no more than shin deep. So moving on to number two. And 12.35, so only a few minutes later, Nick. And I only just looked at this today, um, looked at the name, Maduri Guy Australis. Look at the colour of it. Do you think the person that named this had a thing for Maduri, saw the colour of the slug and went perfect? So this is a photo taken by Nick. This is one taken by Nicole. And as you can see, it's like a sort of quite a small branching brown algae where this one was found. And then just for scale, that's my iridescent finger that's there and there's the little slug in there. So we're off to a good start. We found a few in a couple of minutes. Number three at 12.36 and it was me. So again, this is um, a sap sucking sea slug, I believe, Elysia cogensis. Again, quite tiny. You can actually see underneath if you look hard enough, there's little air bubbles. So if you think of how small the air bubbles are in rock pools, that's the sort of size that you're talking of these things. So you do have to look hard. Now, Judge Judy, this is the warning. This is the cutoff. So get in your names. So who you think found the most and how many slugs do you think we found for the day? All right, Judy has spoken. It is time to move on. Number four, about half an hour later, found by me is this beautiful species, Doris Cameroni. So the three photos are actually from three separate, the three of us all taking photos of the same species. Part of it was for, we were all using the same camera. 
If you don't have a camera and you are thinking of getting an underwater camera, the ones we use for this is just an Olympus TG5. There's, I think, Olympus TG6 are out at the moment. Um, they're a kind of a dual um, point and click camera, but the macro fun function and there also is a microscope function is really handy for capturing photos of these tiny little guys. So we're moving on again. We've just gone past one o'clock and Nick has come through with this beautiful species, this Robin Ella Wilson eye, which I thought was named after a guy called Robin Wilson at the museum. It turns out it's not. It's just an interesting coincidence. Uh, as you can see, Nick's photo is the one with the name underneath it. Nicole took the blurry photo to the right. So these things can be quite tricky, not only to see, but also to get a good photograph. But they look spectacular when you do. And whoever's going to win the posters, there's a really beautiful photo of that on there for you to enjoy. So moving on. Number six was Nick, and this is my favourite species. Um, I will tell you why and show you my Christmas tree decoration of Madrella species. If you ask me in the questions, if you don't ask me, I'm not going to tell you. But very cool little species. Again, three different um, photographers. My photo is the one on the left. The finger photo is Nicole, and then Nick's photo is on the right. So as you can see, Nick takes some quite nice shots. And this is Madrella species RB1. I'll explain that more later. So we're on to seven. Half past one, we're doing well, seven species. Found by me. And this looks similar to the one we had earlier, but it's not. So Catalucia affinis, you'd see the iridescent colors starting to sort of show on the, my mind's gone blank. I forgot the name of the bits that come out of the side. I'm sure someone can remind me later. But they got this beautiful coloration in it. And if you look at this shot, you can see just in front of my thumb, that is the individual we're looking for. But what you can see is where we're looking. We're also looking in this sort of kelp area. So this is actually in a rock pool that at low tide is completely cut off to the sea. There's absolutely no surge. And what you have to do is basically work your way through the kelp and look very slowly, very carefully. And you're looking for these tiny little things that just stand out. They just look that little bit different. And that's where you'll tend to find them. And I would say over 50%, so probably 70% of the species were found, we found were in, found in just the one rock pool. So moving on, number eight. This was again, just before two o'clock. So we're doing well. It was by Nick. So this is you, Brankus. This guy is tiny. Um, if you think pinky fingernail, you're thinking way too big, really difficult to get a, a picture of. And as I mentioned before, it's called RB1. So it's called species RB1. So what happens in taxonomy, particularly of species that aren't studied that widely, is that the people that work on them give these little placeholder names to them until someone has the time, energy, funding to be able to work out what, what, what they actually are and where they fit into the tree of life. And the person who does that in Victoria is this guy, Bob Byrne. Um, the photo on the left is taken not far from, hopefully it's up on the left for you guys. If it's not, I'm talking the wrong way. Of him standing in the rock pool with, that's a kitchen sieve and a bucket. There's the tools that Bob has used his whole life to discover over 300 nudibranchs in Victoria. Many of them have never been like new to science. Uh, there's Bob, that's in his house, sitting at his microscope. And the book that I've got there, I will give a plug. It's available through the museum. It has some beautiful uh, photos of a lot of the nudibranchs that you'll find in Victoria. And then there's the little sort of sketch that I quite like. The, Mollusk sketch of Bob Byrne because that's pretty much what he does. He doesn't dive, he doesn't snorkel, he just wades around with his bucket and his sieve. And the best part is that Bob is a building contractor. I think third generation building contractor that lives in Geelong and has been doing this for over 40 years in his spare time. So this is just something that he does for the love of it. He's published over about 100 papers, taxonomic papers. And as I mentioned before, he's added significantly to what we know. And he's just a guy that is doing this in his spare time. Obviously, it's not something that takes over his life or his house. Uh, no, actually, it does. I've been to his house. It's covered in taxonomic papers and literature from like the 1800s. It's absolutely incredible. So the tally stands at Nicole 1, Nick 4, K3. 
So look, I can tell you if you've gone with Nicole, you're out of the race. If you've gone with Nick or myself, the race is still going. Now I'm not going to give away who found the last few, but we will continue on. So number nine, just past two, Nicole and I were eating lunch and Nick found this guy. The interesting thing about this, again, he's absolutely tiny, but it is not commonly found in Victoria. In fact, as far as we know, it's the first sighting in a couple of years. It may have been sighted by other people. I'm not saying that, but it's the first sighting that we're aware of. Um, but again, very difficult, most likely a juvenile. Number 10. Now we're starting to get a longer time lag between it. We, this rock pool isn't overly big, so we are covering the same area. And if you look very carefully, the camera is pointing at something. There's a little white blob. This is sort of that bit where you can see if you've got your eye in, if you can spot the sort of abnormality in there, right there. And that's this guy, this phyllodesmia. Absolutely beautiful. The serrata, there you go, it's come to me, that are on its back that come out. The colour inside that can vary because it will vary depending on what they're eating. So if they're eating something brown, it'll tend to be brown. Or if they're eating something red, it will tend to be more pink. So they're basically, they're, in a sense, they're transparent and the digestive glands are all sort of shown through there so you can see what they've been eating. So we're up to 10, so we're doing all right. And here we go, this Corypholina, previously known as Flabolina, and as I mentioned before, Taxonomy, when it comes to these tiny species, is constantly changing. It is very difficult to get a steady name because someone will do a study of the genus or the group that they're in and the names will all change and they'll all be moved around. The only trick I can say for that is get yourself a good reference book, call it whatever's in your reference book. If every time you see it, if you're wrong, at least you're going to be consistently wrong and you can always change it later. So if anyone guessed 11 species, congratulations, you guessed the amount that we discovered in a day. We spent about three to four hours in the water between three of us and we discovered 11 species. We did see a couple of species twice, so I haven't put them in. So drum roll. As I mentioned, coming in at number three was Nicole with two species. She did find more, but they were ones we'd already discovered. Oh, I'm going backwards and coming in at number two is the Bogan from the 90s. The only thing that fit me in that I still have from the 90s is my football jumper from Grovedale. So hi to any of the Geelong crew uh, with four species and the school teacher with four kids that works as a, um, I've mentioned that as a school teacher is the one who Nick came in with five. Nick has been joining us in this following event for several a couple of years now and has always been able to find a lot so why do we do it why did we go out and do this and basically why am i talking to you about this tonight um, because basically we became a part of this thing that started off as a friendly competition so it was between two researchers in New South Wales, particularly at Port Stephens. If anyone's been diving at Port Stephens, there's some beautiful shore dives you can do there. And they would just do a dive over a weekend, dive over the weekend and see how many new ranks they could take photos. And it was just the two of them. And they would trash talk in the car park and other divers would overhear them and then they'd start joining in, talking about what they found as well. And they decided to just run it as an event. Let's see what we can find. So what they have found since doing it, so 2013, the idea is promoting the weird and wonderful. It's a really great way to get people sort of looking and seeing what's there. And what they've been able to do, so they recently published a paper that indicated that 37 species have been found for the first time way south of their previous known distribution. So basically what we're getting and what's predicted under climate change models is that we get a strengthening of the East Australian current, which pushes the warm water down, the warm tropical water down the East Coast and carries these larvae, not just of sea slugs, but all sorts of different species. But sea slugs are the things that people seem to notice. And particularly with the sea slugs, like divers may not be able to notice if a new species of algae or a bryozoan or a hydroid or something has turned up because there's hundreds of them and they all look so similar. But they will spot sea slugs. Um, they do stand out. They look quite amazing. And they're also an indication of changes of food. So the other thing too is while you're looking that close is you tend to see all these other amazing things like shrimp, amphipods, snails, kelpfish, crabs, algae. And once you start looking, you start appreciating the diversity, the complexity, and you realize how little you know 
and what you've actually missed um, by skimming over these areas and going over so fast. And you also get a really good understanding of how important diversity is. And I think the best analogy for me is when it comes to the lockdown, I was in Melbourne, you really got to know your 5Ks. So the more different things you had within that 5Ks, the more, uh, I guess, the more diversity you had within that four, 5Ks, the more you had to sort of stimulate you and keep you going. It's the same for our environment. Principle works much the same. As I mentioned, responses to change. So we saw, we actually sort of parallel had this idea and then we saw what they were doing in 20 through Southern Cross Uni. So we joined them and started the Melbourne Sea, sea Slug Census, which I know Bethany from Coast Care loves saying because she has a little bit of a list. Um, so slugging out for science was one of the tags we had. We also had we see sea slugs by the seashore, which is a really good one to say seven times quick. But since April in 2018, we've had seven censuses. We were only going to have three, but people enjoyed them so much. We get an average of 50 to 100 people at each event. We had 150 turn up to the first one and the guys from Southern Cross Uni came down and their comment was, I don't think we've had this many people turn up to all our events added up. So when it comes to turnout and people being interested in the environment, Melbourne, Victoria represent really well. So that is something that's really exciting. But in that time of about the 300 species that we know there, and this is census is only run for two to four days. So they either run over a weekend or we'll tack a Friday and a Monday on the end because some people don't like diving over weekends when it's busy because they're retired and we'd like to involve them as well. So seven censuses at four days. So what's that? 14, 20, my blank, 35 days, basically. So 35 days of effort, we've been able to record 174 species. And that is just taken by divers. So it's not scientists involved. It is just, you know, all the dive community getting on board, going out and just taking photos of these slugs when they're out there. We've got at least four of the species that have never been seen. So the way we go about it is we get all the photos, we compile them. And then because Bob is very old school, we can't send him an email. We actually have to print them out or visit him with our computer and run through each photo individually. And several of them, he's been like, I've never seen that in my life before. Can you get me a specimen? The hard part is because the photos have often been taken a week or two earlier is trying to chase up and get that specimen. We haven't been able to do that, but we believe there's obviously quite a few species out there that are still yet to be seen. And given Bob's been doing it for 40 years, it's pretty impressive that we've found a few that he hasn't seen so far. But it's something that anyone can do. The people that found these new species weren't people that went looking for nudibranchs all the time. They were just people that sent in some random photos and didn't realise the importance of them. And the other thing we discovered is we had a range expansion. So we're talking about the strengthening of the East Australian current and that pushing warm water. We had a nudibranch that's previously been seen at Beware Reef um, in the sort of east of the state, work its way through to Gippsland Lakes and then also been seen in Port Phillip Bay. So that was documented and reported in the Malacological Society of Australia. The best thing is, and this is the work that they've been doing at Southern Cross University, they looked at 13 censuses over three years and they produced this paper, which was um, written and put into the I think it's Journal of Molluscan Research, I believe it might be. But basically it's showing that volunteers provide similar data to the scientists. So citizen scientists at Port Stephens captured, I'm not going to read the slide, 89% of the species. So what you have is that the divers that are out there and even the divers that aren't there out there all the time, basically they have a trained eye. They're able to find these things. They're able to discover these things. And species richness, so that number of species in an area, 97%. So basically what they've found through their research is that you can get citizen scientists, you can get everyday people help you do scientifically valid studies so that we can actually learn a lot more about what we get there. And the beauty of these guys is that photos work. Photos are a really easy and good way to be able to know what we've got. If you're interested in taking some photos, here's a nice profile and a way to take it. But I'll be honest with you, the photos that I showed you before from our um, 11 species that we found in the rock pool, I would say 90% of mine were blurry. So yes, it's nice to have this as an outlay of what you're going to get. But what is it? If you can't tie knots, tie lots. It's kind of similar to that for me anyway, when it comes to photography. And if you're just starting out, just make sure you take quite a few and at a lot of different angles. 
It also explains some of the different features that are on it. And if you would like to get involved, you can jump on our web page. Um, at the bottom of the page, you can sign up for a newsletter. We don't send out many newsletters. We only send out newsletters when we're actually doing something. Uh, we won't spam you. And if you really want to get involved, the next census is the long weekend in March, so the Labor Day weekend in March. I've already booked myself a campsite at Blair Gowrie, which is basically on the beach because Blair Gowrie Pier is probably one of the hot spots in Victoria for um, sea slugs being found. There's one diver who's spotted, I think he's up to about 120, if not 130 species there and documented them over the course of several years, but it is definitely a spot that you are likely to come across them. It gives you a bit of time to practice as well. Now, if you just want to see some more images, see what's around, see what's going on, or if you feel like, well, traveling to Queensland, New South Wales might be a bit difficult at the moment, but you can join the CSOC census. This is just a Facebook group. It's open to the public and they will post when things are going on. They actually do a CSOC census in Lord Howe Island, which I haven't been able to work out a way that I can legitimately get there, but I would love to. Um, and it'll give you an idea what's happening in other states. So if you're from somewhere else, it can give you an idea. There's quite a few going on the east coast of Australia at different times of the year. You can join in. The Gold Coast one is one that I need to go to because the prizes are bonkers. There's a whole lot of wetsuits and dives and all sorts of stuff. They go all out. And I have a feeling that's in about September of October um, each year. And I've never been diving in the Gold Coast, so it's probably a bit warmer than what we get in Victoria at that time of the year. Another local spot. Now, I believe all these links are being shared in the chat and you will also get an email with all these links, so don't worry about them too much now. And again, this is just another Facebook page called Nudie Branks Victoria. It was started by a couple of people that really enjoy the sea slug census and then just wanted to sort of find out more, started their group, and they've been documenting a lot of findings outside of the census time, but also just sharing identification skills. The knowledge that is within that within that group far surpasses what I've been able to give you tonight. So it's a really good place just to learn what other people are finding, how they find them, where they find them. It's a private group. If you type in that you went to tonight's talk, I'm sure they will be let you in, or maybe that will work against you because they know me quite well. But you should be fine. You'll be able to get in. And it's just a great way to, again, discover more and sort of see what people are up to. But what I would really like to see people to do, and so this is a project I started up during um, COVID. It's on the iNaturalist platform. The link I've got here is to our website, which basically has some um, really simple, uh, what's the word, instructions on how to get involved and even a couple of videos. So you, if you want to keep hearing my dulcet tones, you can hear them again when we get when you listen to those videos and what we're doing here it's just marine life of victoria it is quite simple upload any photos of any marine life that you see from anywhere in the state so sea slugs are a part of it but what it is it's a uh, it's a group of naturalists taxonomists people that are just interested in the natural environment all helping each other learn more about what you have so if you've got nice clear photos and the species that you have can be identified by a photo. You put it up there and people will start telling you what it is. It works for birds, it works for plants as well. There's a whole lot of different projects, but this one is basically about marine life. So it doesn't matter where you are in Victoria, doesn't matter if you dive, beach combing, take a photo of stuff. And if you wanna know what it is, put it up here. Put it in your best guess and then wait for people to come through and help you out with it. I find most of the time I put my photos up and within 15 to 20 minutes, someone's been through and they've either verified that I was right, told me I was wrong or suggested because I didn't know what it was, what I was actually saying. It's an incredibly powerful resource and it also provides really valuable information to a lot of researchers and a lot of scientists and natural resource managers. There is also a particular page within iNaturalist just for Victorian nudibranchs. Um, I think they're up to about 1,200 sort of sightings and maybe it's a couple of hundred species in there. Again, another great spot to, you can share your photos with Marine Life of Victoria and with the Victoria Nudie Brand page. And it's a great way to add to the information out there and add to the knowledge base. Um, we're all sort of doing our little bit just by adding those one or two photos each time you go out. <coughs> now I was talking about the amazing chains that um, 
of nudibranchs and often with these things and that's why I actually went out and took photos for this talk to show you what you can see as opposed to just putting beautiful photos from nudibranch species around the world that we're I'm never likely to see um, or you're never likely to see and when we talked about that chain uh, that reproduction chain I actually have a video here and this was taken by Steve Don Steve Dunn who lives down in Inverloch Way and this was in the Inverloch Lagoon only 10 days ago and this is a chain of Aplysia juliana they're called forming one long chain and that messy sort of stuff you see on the head of them is eggs. I'm not 100%. I don't know if they're their eggs. I'm probably assuming they are. Um, and I'm just going to read to you some of the comments that came here from some of the people that know a lot more about um, nudibranchs than I do. And uh, the question was, can they form a loop? Yes, but it is possible to close the chain to form a loop so that they may all, par all participate in insemination, i.e. each one is getting some. The eggs and sperm are generated in organs that are contained within the hump next to each other however the sperm travels along the external groove to the right side of the head which is where the penis is the animal then climbs onto the animal in front and places its head next to the female duct and inseminate it. that's why they are stacked that way and goes on to say it fascinated that the sperm travels along the outside of the body in a ciliated groove without it being washed into the water so the proof that it exists just go out there do some searching, who knows what you're going to see, and I hope to see some of your photos, particularly on the sea slug census and turning up on the Marine Life of Victoria page. Thank you very much for your time, and I should move forward one more slide. Sorry about that. And I will hand it back to the curators. Hi Kay, Tracy here. I'm just going to talk over the top of you just for one second. Um, Please we've had, do. We've had a couple of questions um, pop up in the chat, so I'll just ask those ones of you now. So I do apologise, someone has asked you why is it your favourite? And I believe when you were speaking about the different <laughs> species, but I'm not sure which one it was, so I'm sorry about that, but can you That's answer right. potentially which that was? So can people see me? Yes, they can. So this is my Christmas decoration, and this is the Madrella species. Um, what you can see is it has its oh, these rhinophores, which are the sense organs up the top here. And when you look at the, some of the photos of them and uh, cover your kid's eyes, it looks like it's swimming along doing that. It looks like it's crawling along the bottom, giving everyone the birds. It just has the most attitude for an animal that I've ever seen. So absolutely adore it. And that snorkel that I went on Monday was the first time I'd actually seen one. So I was like squealing like a little kid when I saw it and was overcome with joy. And then it meant that I actually deserved my Christmas decoration and was able to put it on my tree. So yeah, that answers that one. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, we had someone else ask a question regarding, in reference to the number 10th species that was found, why do they have different colours? Uh, that, if I remember correctly, just let me go back. I have a feeling that was a me issue, not a, um, <laughs> in that there was two, we found two of them. And I believe, oh, number 10? Yep. Okay, so that's just a file of, oh, the different colors depends on the different food that they eat. So it, it will depend on their diet. So whatever they've been chewing on will, come out into their serrata which are on the outside of their body they actually have their glands like their digestive glands are in the serrata so as the food basically travels through it's almost transparent so you will see whatever color food they're eating will go basically go through them and now because there's some that eat eggs and there's some that eat plants i don't know whether they're an egg eater or not as i said there's a lot of people that know a lot more about this than i do um, but it is based on their food source whatever that may be oh excellent um, we've got another one here. Do you need scuba gear or can you do okay with simple surface snorkeling? That's all we did was snorkeling. We basically had a mask and snorkel and I guess the, the trick is low, low tides, which is when we organise the census. That's why we pick it. We pick the lowest tides that are available over a weekend and get yourself a nice sheltered big rock pool. So that was a point long style. There's a couple of nice big rock pools at Point Lonsdale there. I believe Port Sea Sorrento, they're around the back beach. There's a couple that are sheltered as well. Then um, 
they can be a bit more treacherous, I think, because of swell. So you really have to keep an eye on the swell conditions um, and just find yourself some nice um, shallow areas. What? And again, this is theories. Sea slugs, sea slug hunters have theories like fishermen. You know how fishermen have their, you know, I'm on not, my knees swollen today, so the snapper are going to be biting type of thing. People that look for sea slugs have similar sort of suspicions. And so one of them is, and particularly with Point Lonsdale, we believe is that you need that water movement. So you've got water moving across these rock pools, delivering fresh water all the time, but it's also delivering larvae. It's delivering a whole lot of stuff. But then you've got that still water at the depth. And I was amazed. It was a 36 degree day when we went out and putting my hands down the bottom, looking at the kelp in the bottom and sort of pulling, there was these cold water pockets. So the temperature was a couple of degrees different in these cold water pockets. And that would be often where you would find them because they're getting out of that sort of the heat zone and moving down into that cold water. So mask and snorkel gear, Nick Shaw, who is probably who was with us, is probably found over 100 species and he's only ever used a mask and snorkel. Bob Byrne, who the guy who has written the book that I have here and I showed you, has never put a mask and snorkel on in his life and he's been able to get all that information. Uh, the kitchen sieve works really well. Make sure in an area you can use it. I'm, I don't know if they appreciate it much in marine parks. Um, but again, if you're putting stuff back in the water, but it is a way of finding things that you can't see. So he will basically get a bit of weed that's floating around, put it in a bucket, swish it around with a sieve and basically look for movement. So there's a whole lot of different ways. Diving actually is a short way of doing it because you've only got however long your tank lasts. Um, there's a guy, Ian Scully, who goes out at... Um, Blair Gary, who spent three hours underwater, which is a bit um, unique as far as his time that he can spend. And he's the one who's found over 100 and something species. But yeah, just just get out there any which way. Kids can do it. Um, I think as I mentioned to people on the radio and I mentioned to you guys, I did this last year down at Warrnambool and said to the kids that were with me doing a rock pool ramble, I'll give you a sausage for each one you found. And I still owe the kids at Warrnambool several hundred sausages because there are a lot of them there at Kalani Beach. So anyone can find them, yes. They'll be cashing you on those sausages one day. Yeah, yeah, I've just got to get back down there. Um, so we've got another question coming, and I apologise, I'm sure I'm going to pronounce this wrong. Do all apistra branches? I'm not trying to say that. Apistra branches, that's good. Yeah. Do, they all have, do they have genitals on the same side of their body? Uh, that will be a I don't know. Feel free to shoot me an email with that question so I can follow it up with pe with people that know more than I do. No, I'm more than happy to say I don't know some of these things. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's that's often the best answer. Good, good question though. I'm curious why they want to know as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we've got another one here. Oh. Where's that gone? It just disappeared on me. Oh, hang on, it's just been published. Apologies. Um, has a sea slug census been done in seagrass meadows? Uh, so there is a group that go out at Jawbone, which is at Williamstown, um, right near the sort of the top of Port Phillip Bay, and they will have a look in all habitats. So they will look in seagrass, but it hasn't been extensively. Um, I guess, searched for the sea slug census. So there is also a group called the Field Nats of Victoria and they have a marine research group and they have been everywhere. Bob's a part of the marine research group. So Bob Byrne, who's found a lot of them as part of the marine research group and they have looked everywhere. There are several species that will only be found in seagrass beds. That's one of the things I probably forgot to mention is there, they can be very habitat and food specific. specific. Um, with the exception of the ones in that Point Lonsdale rock pool, for whatever reason, that rock pool just has this weird and wonderful variety of species that just happen to land there. And I believe it's the pool that Bob himself in one tidal cycle found over 40 species. Wow. So, yeah, we only found 11 and that was three of us and it was just him and a mate. So, yeah, I've got a long way to go before you know taking over that mantle. <laughs> um, so we've still got a couple more questions and yeah, keep them coming in. So we've got, does diet affect the colour of the nudies? It does. Yeah. So as I mentioned before, um, yeah. depending on what they eat, um, they will affect. So there are some that eat eggs, so they will actually eat other nudibranch eggs. Um, and that in particular, you'll see the egg ribbons out. I didn't show a slide of the egg ribbons. They're just as beautiful themselves. Um, I do have a slide. if. You can bear with me. So is it just me on screen at the moment? Yeah. All right. Can you? Oh, 
do the share screen just so people can see this one. Yep, there we go. You're up now. Yep. So if you remember that last bit of video I showed you, it was like that squirrely mass and they were just sort of, it was kind of like my bedroom as a kid and I won't lie, probably like my desk as an adult. It was just a mess all over the place. And you look at some of these colours and the patterns and even the symmetry with some of these eggs, are absolutely amazing. But you can see the variation in colours and there are some species that will eat the eggs of other nudibranchs. So depending on the colour of the eggs they eat, will change the colour of the body. So there you go. Thank you for that. Um, we've got another one here in regards to sort of a citizen science question. What additional information do you need when submitting a photo? I guess they're asking, kind of, and then they've sort of said environmental. So I'm not sure, quite sure if we need a little bit more information with that question. Or... No, that's, that's all right. So with the photos, all we're looking for is a location and a date um, because it's easy enough to get weather information and sort of larger scale information um, from whether it's a Bureau of Meteorology and other places as far as what's going on there. So we need to know the location, we need to know the date um, and the time is kind of preferable as well. Some people are hesitant to give away their exact location so you can say it was kind of in this area because they want to protect their favourite little nudie hunting grounds. But um, Sorry, your secret safe with me. Excellent. I'm just having another quick look to see if we've got any more. I think we've got a couple more questions that have come in. Did anyone win the prize? Did anyone? Oh, yes, yes. Sorry. <laughs> so we did have um, someone guessed peanut worm correctly. Actually, there was two guesses, but the first well person got in. So they. Oh, sorry. If there were, if there were two that got it, if both of them can um, share their address, I'll send posters out to both of them. Oh, amazing. Yeah. Fantastic. I'm and sure then how, like that. how do we go closest to the pin? Yeah, so closest, we had someone guess Nick correctly, but no one actually got Nick and 11. The correct answer we had was Nick and 12. That was the closest one we ended up receiving. Oh, fantastic. But Congratulations. Great. We ended up getting so many, so many responses, so that was wonderful. <laughs> oh, that's good. Congratulations to the person that's got it right. As I said, I'll send out a, a few posters to each person, um, feel free to share them. And for those that didn't get posters, don't worry. Um, COVID has affected our ability to get these out into the local dive stores, but we will also have them in our office, which has opened back up um, in the city. But also drop me a, um, an email and there's always ways to work out, you know, a handover, a dodgy handover in a car park or something like that. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got another one that's coming here. Um, are they man? I'm um, sorry. Are nudies mainly found on weed and marine plants, or are some found more frequently on rock? Um, and she's also mentioned that she's seen a lot of photos of nudies on the sand as well. They are found everywhere. So you will find them um, on rocks, sort of on the underside of rocks. You have bryozoans, which are these really brittle animals that look like a coral that some exclusively feed on and pretty much live on. There's um, hydroids, which are like these tiny little stinging, oh, again, animals that um, they will again feed on. Quite often people will take a photo of say a hydroid or brozone and then when they get home, they're like, oh, there's a nudie there. I didn't see that at the time, but there's something there. You will find some on algae. Um, the place where we went at Point Lonsdale is a bit unique in that you do find a lot on that sort of brown kelp and I think they just sort of come out of the water column and looking like they're on their way to try and find their particular niche. Um, but there was the, perp the pink one that was on the sponge. If you see that pink spiky sponge wherever you go, take have a close look. There's two species that you can often find kind of there um, and they are found on the sand. There is one species, oh, they're called head shield slugs. So they have the body shape, I guess, that they can sort of put something over their head and they will dive down underneath their prey and then come up and basically, you know, eat. Oh, I think it's, is it worms or bivalve shells? They will eat. So they've, they've found it on the um, sand. And again, like slugs at home, mornings and evenings are often really good time. So those that are really serious will get up really early in the morning and go out and other people will do sort of night dives. And Nick will actually do night snorkels. 
So he will go out snorkeling at night time. You obviously have to be really careful, good conditions, make sure you're in a nice sheltered rock pool. But all you need is just a waterproof torch, which these days everything is getting so much cheaper. Um, and away he goes, he said he finds a lot of them at night because they, it's a lot cooler and so they come out. So check all habitats, all times of days, all locations, everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere. Yeah, it does definitely sounds like they are everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Um, we've got one more and we might sort of finish up with this one so we can um, look at wrapping up and keeping to time for people. So we've got, and I'm not, I'm not going to try and pronounce the scientific name, but um, are the infamous Spanish dancers ever found in Victoria? So uh, one of the first slides I put was that little purple and orange one, um, which moves very much like a Spanish dancer, except it is only like eyeball kind of big. Um, the Spanish dancer that I believe the um, person is referring to, I don't believe they're, they're a lot larger and like you see them moving through gracefully, sort of hypnotically through the water column, which is what I was going to do if my slides weren't going to work. I was going to do it by interpretive dance, but I've, everyone's been saved that tonight. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the answer is I haven't seen it. I am not aware, but um, again, there are probably people that spend more time out there and have seen more that may have a better understanding of that. Um, iNaturalist is a really good place to see if these things have been spotted outside of their range or in different places. So you can actually go to iNaturalist and type in whatever it is you're interested in. And the best part is it actually brings up like a photo catalog of it. So if you're interested in that species, type it into iNaturalist and it will show you where they've all been seen and actually the photos of them that have been taken by various people. And what you can often find is that um, People might be experts in the field and you can just type them directly your question. So you can start talking to experts quite easily. It's incredible. It's kind of like Facebook for nerds is the way I look at it. I love it. It's, I spend far too much time there uploading my terrible photos of birds, bees, plants, animals, the whole lot. It's, it's a really, really good way to learn more about your local environment. It's just a fantastic resource, isn't it? Sure is, yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, thanks for that, Kate. I'm going to pass back over to Phil now um, from Coast Care, who's going to finish off a few final messages. Um, but yeah, thanks again. Most welcome. It was great fun. I hope to see a few more people out doing a sea slug census. Oh, hang on a minute, Phil. You're just on mute there. You might have to. Uh, all right. Uh, unmuted myself. Um, wow, 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 Kate. Thanks so much for such a passionate and engaging presentation and for sharing the sensational sea slugs by the seashore. Um, I've been fortunate to attend several of Cade's talks within workshops, forums and conferences over many years, not to mention all things wet and salty. Plug for Radio Marinara 102.7 FM Triple R on Sunday, 9 to 10 o'clock. You'll hear Cade's dulcet, dulcet tones on the radio. Um, we're incredibly lucky to have Cade presenting uh, Slugging It Out for Science on behalf of the Victorian National Park Association or VNPA. Thanks so much for your time. If you'd like to know more about volunteering, you can get in contact with your local Coast Care facilitator for support. We'd really appreciate it if you could take the time to fill out an evaluation that Tracy is going to put in the uh, chat box. Uh, the, the value of this is that this will help us plan other and future activities. So thanks for your participation and thanks for your involvement. All right, bye.